Hey folks, thanks for tuning in to this bonus episode of Shifting Schools, where we're actually bringing you a conversation from another project that I'm working on. This is a mini series from the folks at NEASC. This is a series that is looking all at leadership in anticipation of the upcoming leadership conference in Boston that kicks off December 6th. If you'll be at that event, I'll be there presenting. I would love to connect with fellow listeners of the Shifting Schools podcast. So drop me a line. My email address is in the show notes. In the show notes, you're also going to find more information about this NEASC podcast series. You're about to hear episode one, which is a conversation with United States Principal of the Year, Donna Hayward. If you're a school leader or you're aspiring towards school leadership, she's got incredible expertise and wisdom to share. Before we dig into that conversation, I also want to let you know that coming up in the new calendar year, Jeff and I are really excited about a few plans that we have for podcast listeners. We'll be kicking off the new year with a special mini series on all things mental health, and we've got great guests lined up for that. We also have a series in the works that's looking at different industries and how they are being influenced by AI. Now, you may have heard Jeff and I talk in the past about the amount of time that it takes to coordinate and organize a mini series. That's why we're asking you right now if you have a request for a mini series that you would love to see us dig into in 2024, please reach out. We are always trying to be as responsive as possible, and we love getting requests from listeners like you. So, that email address is in the show notes as is the link to learn more about the NEASC event and their podcast series, Sustainable Innovation. Without further ado, here is the Sustainable Innovation Podcast, episode number one, talking with the U.S. 2023 Principal of the Year, Donna Hayward. Welcome to NEASC's Sustainable Innovation mini podcast series. I am your host, Trisha Friedman, and we are so excited to kick off this brand new series because NEASC is focusing on the idea of sustainable innovation this year at the December event in Boston. We want to go beyond sharing new ideas and tackle the challenge of implementing innovative practices in a way that respects the capacity, resources, mission, and members of your school community. Learn how to create cultures of sustainable innovation in our schools rather than those of fear, fads, or burnout. Today, we are so excited to be kicking off the series with special guest Donna Hayward. She was honored as the Connecticut Assistant Principal of the Year in 2006. She now serves as principal of Haddam Killingsworth High School, which earned the National Blue Ribbon in her fourth year. Donna was named Connecticut Principal of the Year in 2022 and is the NASSP's National Principal of the Year for 2023. From that platform, Donna has advocated for educators in Washington, D.C. and across the country to elevate educators and public education, to secure more mental health support for young people, to protect teachers and administrators from defamation on social media, and of course, to support women in leadership. Welcome to the show, Donna Hayward. Uh, we are so excited to be speaking with you. You've got so much experience, expertise, so we're going to do the best that we can to just sort of have that on tap for listeners. And we wanted to start by talking about ways that uh, successful school leaders like yourself create a culture of sustainable innovation. We think that stories are always a great way to think about that. So would you be able to share a story with us that illustrates your philosophy around change management? Like if we know this story about Donna, we know how it is that she approaches change management. Sure. I'd be happy to talk about change and change is always right. It's every, every year, um, sometimes multiple times, big changes, small changes. So my general, let me go general, and then I'll give you a specific um, that departs from that, because sometimes we can't always do things the same way. Um, my general approach to change management um, is for the team to identify what changes need to be made 
together. And the way that we do that is um, is all around a data-based approach to school improvement. Specifically um, for us, each cycle begins in August um, leading up to a school year where in my leadership team, and by leadership team, I mean all my department heads, my, of course, administrative team, the athletic director, um, basically anyone in charge of leading a group of people, we come together for a full day in August. And we do a deep dive into all of the data that we can possibly get our hands in, for, hands on from the previous year. So, of course, there's the standardized test data and all the data that you would expect to be in a data team meeting, right? But there's also the softer data. There's attendance. There's tardy. There's discipline. There's um, number of athletes who needed to be on eligibility sheets. There's everything that you can possibly measure. We measure. Maybe we'll use it. Maybe we won't. But it's all on the table for review. Um, and my team really just dives in and looks for certainly the points to celebrate because one of the things we don't do enough in this um, human endeavor is celebrate when we have been successful and we have a lot of success, a lot of success. And we need to always um, take time to note that, oh, yes, we worked hard. We really dug deep and it worked. But we also, of course, look for and where do we need to improve? Where are our gaps? Where are our weak points? Which kids are not doing as well as we want them to. And so the team really kind of discovers what we need to work on together. So there isn't, a, I don't have to sell it, right? The team discovers it on their own. And then what we do with that um, continuous improvement plan work that we do that day is my leadership team actually leads the first faculty meeting of the year. When all the teachers come back in August and the kids aren't back yet, my leadership team actually presents the data that we have, um, that we have waded through and what goals that we are setting based on the needs that we have. And so the sell is done. So while teachers might not like, oh no, we, you know, we, we have a gap in our, you know, math um, performance, for example, between our high needs kids and our kids who aren't high needs, they might not like that because who would ever like that, but at least I don't have to persuade them that there's a problem because the data speaks for itself and the teachers are the ones who are sharing it. So in terms of change management and what we focus on and where we um, put our energy in any given year, which is often part of the change work, um, it's, it's just kind of done for us in this manner. Um, but in terms of then helping folks through the change, great, I don't have to sell it. I don't have to persuade anybody that we need to do this work, but that doesn't mean the work isn't hard. And that doesn't mean that change isn't hard. Um, so my next uh, role, if you will, I think is just um, having respect around the process of change and supporting my people through it. So I am forever telling them, look, look at what we've done in the past. We know how to support our kids. We know what's best for our kids. I know you know how to do this. I know you are talented enough to do this. Tell me how I can support you. Tell me what you need. Usually they're going to ask for time. Usually they're going to ask for, for, for professional development. And so my job is to then give them what they're asking for to support that change. Um, and then certainly communicating um, kind of two PS parts to this. I do not believe in change for change's sake. Like, you know, if it's not broken, you don't have to go out and roll out some innovative new program just so you can say you did some shiny new thing that exhausts teachers and they don't have respect for that, at least in my experience. So why do that? Um, and that's not good for kids. So um, the only other PS I will say is sometimes there's a change that needs to be made. So here's my, here's my example. Um, when I first arrived at HK, um, there was a significant divide between the performance of our special needs students and the mainstream students, significant divide. Um, and I happened to have worked with a special education model in a previous life uh, that I absolutely knew worked. I just knew that it, it was a very difficult um, transition to the program. But once we were on board with the program, students just really tend to flourish in this model. And so I had to persuade my special ed team before I had any street cred, if you will, to make this change. Um, and so because I support them in change and because usually it's their idea, their idea, you know, in quotes, um, to make the change because they've seen what needs to happen from the data, I do reserve some grace and space for once in a blue moon. And I think actually the transition to the special ed model is the only change I've dictated in my 10 years in HK. 
I will simply call it. And I will say, I need you to trust me on this. And I need you to do this. And so that's what I did with my special ed team here. We didn't have time for them to discover it on their own. I saw it. I knew I needed to to address it right away. There was a real ethical issue in letting it sit for another minute. Um, And so my deal with them was, I need you to do this. I need you to work with me. I need you to trust me. But I'll tell you what, at the end of the year, if you are dissatisfied with this change, if you don't see that it's working for kids, you don't have to do it anymore. And, you know, I will let you take a step back and we'll go another direction, knowing what the end of the year was going to look like. So sure enough, the end of the year comes, special ed team looks at it, looks at me and says, okay, (laughs) we get it. Um, So yeah, so there's lots to change, but in general, it's all around the data and letting the team see the change that's needed for themselves and, um, and then just supporting the work around that. I feel like what's underneath the surface of everything you just took us through though, is that there's also sort of this very open, very honest conversation Um, You know, you even mentioning in that instance of you having to kind of dictate a choice, uh, the the self-awareness of I know that, you know, other educators are not going to like me making the call. However, you're also in that position where to a certain extent, it is your job to make those tough calls. I'm wondering, aside from that conversation piece, like the willingness to engage in a lot of conversation, your understanding around like give folks time to really dig into the data, like rather than trying to market something or advertise a choice, like really just deal with the reality. And I love that you pointed out it's the hard data and it's the soft data as well. In terms of bringing folks on board, other than, and please feel free to say, actually, Tricia, that's not a fair representation of what I was saying. Um, You know, that idea of trust, conversation, and I feel like I hear you say as a school leader, You've got to be able to get out of your shoes and back into the shoes of the educator to understand. You know, you mentioned, I think, this idea that change for the sake of change, you're going to you're going to lose folks with that because teachers have so much on their plates. But you're doing that perspective switching, which I think is really a critical skill set of a highly successful school leader. Is there anything else to your recipe of, you know, again, you, you do have that vision. You see where things need to go. Is there anything else that you would say, school leaders, in your recipe for bringing folks on board with change, this is another maybe, you know, like ingredient that doesn't get the credit uh, that it deserves that you think is going to be influential? Sure. I would say, um, and this is going to be no surprise to anyone listening either, I, I think the secret sauce, if you will, and it's not so much of a secret involved in any kind of leadership endeavor is the relationships that you are building. So with any luck at all, before you have to make a big change, you have had the opportunity to build relationships in your school as a new leader coming on board. Like when you're, when you're a new principal or you've changed districts or you're a brand new principal, whatever it is, obviously that can be tricky because it takes a little time to build up those relationships. But the faster you can get to that, um, the faster you can find your teacher leaders um, and let them lead some of the work, the better, because of course, this is a human, human uh, endeavor that we're engaged in, right? Um, And it is all about those relationships, supporting every piece of work that you do, including the change process. And I feel like that's the thing, you're right, it's not so secret, we hear it talked about a lot, but in terms of the execution, Mm -hmm. you know, incredibly challenging. And there's a a wonderful profile on you from uh, from Smith, where you share a bit of advice that you once once received about school leadership in terms of needing to get out there, like be in the cafeteria, be with people, be making those kind of core connections. And I know that, you know, for school leaders, okay, it's easy to say that, like, you know, be out of your office, be visible, be interacting with people, but you have so many competing demands. you know, is that being out there and connecting with people a part of the relationship building? And if yes, how are you able to prioritize that? You know, I, I completely would bet money that a school leader will hear that part of the discussion and say, Donna, I would love to do more of that. But my email inbox is, you know, in the three or four digits and the phone is ringing. Um, what does it mean to you to prioritize relationships? So. Um... I would be completely misleading you 
if I try to tell you that I'm a master of this. I'm not. I struggle with it just as much as anyone else. I have the same stupid email number as everyone else. <laughs> um, on a good day, email goes down. Um, so it's an ebb and flow. It's some days, quite frankly, I never can make, I can't break the plane of my office. I can't seem to get out because everything is on fire in the office. Um, some days I get lucky and there's, you know, a, a big game that's well attended and I can see lots of people and lots of teachers on the sidelines and parents and kids on the field, or there's an assembly, or I just have an awesome day and I get into several classrooms, like which is the best stuff. Um, and then other days I joke with my secretaries, you know, that my famous line is, oh, wait, there's a school attached to my office, you know, and we all chuckle because obviously I'm being facetious, but some days it feels like you're just stuck in your office and you can't get out because some days you are. So I am hardly the expert on that. You're going to have to ask somebody else. <laughs> but, you know, I really appreciate you saying that because I think framing it that way is this is not an everyday thing. Uh, really takes that pressure off feeling like, okay, the perfect idea of a school leader is the one that is out there every single day. Like, I, I really appreciate the authenticity in that answer. Now that our guest has celebrated a small win, it's a perfect segue to tell you more about the special sponsor who's made this mini series possible, Small Wins Dashboard. We know how challenging it can be to maintain momentum towards big goals. Small Wins Dashboard, created by educators with educators in mind, understands these challenges deeply. It's more than a goal tracking tool. It's a catalyst for sustaining innovation and growth. The Small Wins Dashboard easily captures the full story of progress while school teams journey toward their strategic goals. Small Wins evidence helps teams clearly see what's working in real time so they can immediately use those insights to move closer to their goals. By turning the team's small wins into shared knowledge, the platform fuels professional growth, shared vision, and team success. Everyone on the team contributes to the goal tracking process by reflecting on small wins within their existing team routines, like PLCs, learning walks, or pilots. This approach elevates teacher voice and knowledge and helps leaders build team cohesion and support continual growth. It illustrates not just the successes, but also the lessons learned from what didn't go as planned, fostering a culture of risk-taking and continuous learning. That's why the Small Wins Dashboard exists, to help school teams reach big goals together by tracking small wins together. Want to learn more? Small Wins Dashboard is offering a low-cost trial with no long-term commitment. You can visit smallwinsdashboard.com to book your free 30-minute demo today. You'll learn more about Small Wins Dashboard in the show notes. Now, back to our show. Remember, every small win counts. Um, something else that you've been really authentic about, you know, you have won this incredible award. Folks will be looking to you to speak to the biggest issues in education. I'm glad that you are kind of a voice that's going to be at the center of that narrative, because something that you are saying we need to address is the reality that expectations on school leaders or educators uh, more broadly have changed so significantly. And I, I think for anybody outside of education, maybe it's not been so obvious. Um, and here we are in yet another year where things are incredibly turbulent. There's a lot of change, a lot of shift and change management. I think, you know, if you've got that philosophy, these are the times when it's truly being tested, right? Not when it's easy, but when it's incredibly complicated and complex. Advice for fellow school leaders who are, again, navigating change and it's not easy times. It's going to be, I, I think, a very turbulent, rocky flight ahead. Uh, what are your thoughts on kind of flying the plane when, oh no, this is a, a big, big pocket of turbulence? So, wow. So we don't have enough time for that answer, but let me try to give you the short version. So actually next week I will be um, um, delivering the keynote at the National Blue Ribbon School Conference. And the title of my presentation um, is actually, where do we go from here? 
and it's a essentially uh okay given the statistics around everything you just said right half to three quarters of all educators are, and specifically school leaders are looking to leave the profession in the next one to two years we have the highest burnout rate of any profession in the united states according to the latest gallup poll i can cite these statistics for the next five minutes but it would just depress all of us we're in a tough time right now and we're also caught in the crosshairs of you know partisan rhetoric if you will um we're one of the favorite targets of several um, media and social media channels. Um, you know, we're doing everything wrong. What's wrong with schools? It's just, you know, too popular of a headline. So, um, I do think, and I will speak on what I think needs to change about that and how we sustain. Um, I think a lot of us need to reground ourselves and why we are in this to begin with, like what brought us to education, what keeps us here, like, what are my deep um, what are my deep truths about why I'm in this business? It's not a business, but for lack of a better word, um, why am I doing this? Like, what's the greater outcome here? And I think we need to change some of the things that we've been doing as educators Two things specifically. I think we need to get a lot more out there in terms of advocating for our schools and our teachers and, and ourselves, um, I think we need to be much more vocal at the table. So traditional training, right? is that we smile and we're polite, but we pretty much keep our mouths shut and let the, the voting stakeholders do all of the talking. Well, that's not appropriate. Um, our voices are important. We are the experts on, on um, child development and how to teach kids, how to engage them. No, we don't know everything. Nobody knows everything, but we are experts in our field. And so our voice has to be more represented at the table than it ever has been before. And we need to get real serious about how we advocate for kids and teachers and public education specifically as one of my deep seated commitments. Um, that's one change I think we need to make. And I don't even have enough time to go on and on about that, but I could for about an hour. Um, and the other thing we need to do is find our collective voice. So if you think about how many teachers there are, how many administrators are across this country, I can tell you there's about 100,000 public school principals. And if you think rough numbers that each of us has maybe 100 teachers on average working for us, that's a complete rough guess. That's about 10 million voices. And so if you think about 10 million voices and how if we can get our collective message together, how powerfully we could swing um, our community and um, public opinion back towards the positive around public education and what we're doing every day with our kids in schools, wow, we could change the world. So as soon as I figure out how to get everybody all together at the same time and agree on our message, um, things will get real great real fast, but haven't figured that part out yet. Well, I'm glad your mind is working on that. And again, I, I feel like I've read in a few different profiles on you that you are a big believer in networking, that we have so much to offer one another when we do get connected. Um, is there like kind of like an anecdote that you have around that, like a connection that you have fostered that's really benefited you in the role and the work that you do? Yes. So I've been very lucky this last year. I would say one of the, the greatest gifts of this last year, there have been many positives, as you can imagine. It's also been a very demanding year, um, is I have gotten to know and work alongside um 50 principles of the year, right? 50 state principles of the year. And we get, I get to talk to the, you know, John Bricolet in California and David Aaron Sibia in Texas and Beth Huff from Missouri and all of these fantastic leaders from across the country. And we talk about the work that we're doing and we talk about the challenges we're facing and they're all the same. Like we're, we have a common experience and we have a common struggle often. And so that does two things for any educator. It's certainly done two things for me, um, at least. One is um, teaching and leading education is a very isolating endeavor, right? It's a very, um, teachers are very isolated in what they do and school administrators are especially so. But when you connect with other people who you know are phenomenal at their job, you know they're doing good things and they're they're very skilled at what they do, and you hear that they're having the same challenges that you are, there's something very, there's solace in that. Okay, it's not just me. This is a common problem. It's not just me that can't figure this out. It's It's we that need to work on it. It's all of us that need to work on it. And then the second thing it does 
Um, so there's sustainability there. The second thing it does is then you have a bunch of, you know, frankly, people who are pretty darn good at their job all working together to figure out some of the answers. And you do get an opportunity to connect with a colleague in Nebraska who has really stuck the landing on um, cell phone use in school and like figuring that out and changing the culture so that kids just aren't even tempted to use them anymore or um, social media protections, which is something that I'm working hard on right now in Connecticut. Um, you, you do get really good ideas from folks who have already stuck the landing on the work and can tell you pitfalls to avoid, how they went about it, what their best advice is having gone through it. Um, that's phenomenally powerful. That's some of the best professional development I can think of anywhere. We'll be bringing you even more from Principal of the Year, Donna Hayward, in a part two follow-up to this conversation. When you head over to the show notes, you'll be able to learn more about Donna Hayward, more about our NIASC Sustainable Innovation Conference headed to Boston December 6th to 8th, as well as more about the Small Wins Dashboard. Please be sure to follow the show to catch part two with the incredible Donna Hayward. Thanks for listening.